Good afternoon, all the colleagues on this webinar. My name is Hella Marie. I will be your chair for this webinar. Um, the way we're going to work for, with this is Bronwyn is going to present and then you are welcome to post your chats and your comments and you will be able to raise your hand if you do have a question. I'm going to introduce Dr. Bronman Kutsia. She's a lecturer at Psychology, Stellenbosch University, and a registered Atlas TI instruction, instructor. Welcome, Bronman. Sorry, Hela. I don't know if you can hear me. I can hear you. I can't hear you. Can't you hear me? Gosh. I have no problem hearing you. Um, yeah, I could hear you as well. I can hear you as well, Bronwyn. I don't know if others are able to hear Hela and myself, just any indication. And we get an indication of the other colleagues? Yes, I'm yes. able to hear you. Oh, that's yes. so interesting. I'm, I have no idea why I can't hear you. <laughs> Okay, Bronwyn, you can share your slides and you can begin with Atlas DI. Okay, I'll try that picture, thanks. We will just wait for Bronwyn to actually um, log in and log out and see if she can um, reconnect with us. OK, is this better? That's better, yes. <laughs> and can you hear us now? No idea. I've changed now and I still can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Is the volume potentially down on your computer? OK, let's try again. All right, can you hear us now? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear us? We can hear you. Sorry about this, everyone. I think I may need to just restart and rejoin. Uh, apologies for this. Yes, sorry, everybody. Uh, the technology demons do seem to pop up when we least want them to.
we're just waiting for uh, Bronwyn to log in again and then we will start shortly. Welcome to those that have um, joined us in the meantime. You're welcome to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand during the presentation. Welcome to the colleagues that have joined us. Um, we're just waiting for uh, Dr. Bronwyn Kutia to reconnect so that she can start with the webinar. While we're waiting for um, Bronwyn to connect, um, just an announcement that tomorrow and Friday we will have um, a, 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 more sessions for Library Research Week uh, Thursday. We will have empowering through your research pathway and Friday energizing your inner power. So please consult our uh, online program and um, join us for tomorrow's sessions. Hirchner is Bronwyn still having issues seems so I don't think she's rejoined us yet. yes she's coming yes she's she's sorry on about it. that everyone can you hear me mm. yes we can, can you? hear you not oh, to worry I, I can finally hear all of you I really apologize for that last year um, my microphone was scratchy on the library research week so uh, without fault there was a technical issue once again <laughs> okay we we exciting to hear what you what you're going to present Great. OK, so let me just get stuck into it. So thanks, uh, Kirchner and um, Hela, for uh, for hosting me this afternoon and for um, being invited to present on Atlas TI once again. Um, and apologize to all of the attendees for making me wait. Um, it is always quite uh, interesting when one's presenting on some kind of software program 
um, but the presenters themselves are experiencing a lot of technical issues. So there we are, that's out of the way. Hopefully that's also the end of that. So let me quickly share the slides that I've prepared. Make it a bit bigger. All right, so hopefully everyone can see the slides um, and I'll be switching between these slides um, as well as the actual Atlas TI platform when we get to it. Um, I couldn't hear Hela give the introduction, but of course, as I go through the material, um, you're more than welcome to raise your hand or just simply unmute yourself if you want to ask a question, um, and I'll try my best to, to field it uh, in the moment. All right, so um, my aim for this webinar really is to be able to connect you to Atlas TI resources, training and trainers in the first instance. Um, you'll see that there are a couple of us from Stellenbosch alone that actually um, are trainers on Atlas TI. And many of us who have postgraduate students um, have also become really familiar with it and also provide um, support uh, and research assistance with, with Atlas TI. So in addition to that, Atlas TI also has an amazing web page, which I'll show you um, and post it on their web page as well as um, on the application itself when you launch it through um, on your desktop. They connect you to um, their social media platforms, which has a number of video tutorials and blogs related to Atlas TI and how researchers have used it, um, and also various additional training opportunities. So we have a couple of hours this afternoon to just, or for me to just take you through some of the basic features of Atlas TI but um, we will in no way be able to cover all of the various features of, of Atlas. So um, to be able to know where you can go online to find additional resources and training um, is going to be useful to you. Um, in, in terms of the training, there's lots of free uh, tutorials on the YouTube channel, which are really thorough. And the other important thing to know about Atlas TI is that their, um, their, their support, the Atlas TI support, which you can connect through um, email or via the um, application itself, um, is that their support team is incredibly responsive. So if you have a question or a query or if you have some more complicated or technical issue that cannot be resolved by one of the trainers, then a, a simple email to the support team to people like either Susanna Frizer or um, Marina Kapolkite. Um, these are sort of the more um, senior people at Atlas TI, but they will quickly be able to triage um, and find a way to support you. They'll get back to you within a day or two, and it's quite incredible. Um, I think really it is their responsiveness to the user and taking feedback on board um, that has really led to uh, the stage at which Atlas TI is now, which is in their version 23. When I first began with Atlas TI, it was version 4.2, um, but that doesn't mean there's been a version from 4 all the way to 23. I think after version 9, it sort of jumped to 22 and is now in, in 23. So I'm not actually sure how that numbering has worked. Um, but they have always taken feedback. Um, they always look at um, so some of the queries that are raised by users or you know, really trying their best to make the platform as user-friendly and intuitive as possible um, and to streamline it in such a way that it doesn't have to overly complicate things. So there are many features um, when you open the application and you'll see, but what you also notice is that many of the features are quite um, repetitive. So you may be able to, you'll be presented with many ways to actually access the same feature. Um, but there are a lot more new and interesting um, features of the software. So for example, the AI coding, which everyone is excited about, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, in, the, in the presentation, which can seem um, as though this might be the answer to all of our qualitative research needs. Um, but as I will demonstrate as well, at the end of the day, it still becomes very much a researcher or user-driven approach. So um, qualitative data analysis will still very much be in the control of the researcher 
And again, we will use these tools really to help facilitate things along the way. I'll also provide you, of course, with an overview of the interface and common features and demonstrate to you how Active TI can be used throughout the research process. So I'll talk about sort of the basic research process that may be familiar to all of us and just at each stage of that process, how might you use Active TI to, to facilitate that? Um, and then, of course, I'll offer time for questions and comments at the end, as well as throughout the presentation. So please feel free to ask. But before all of this, some of the frequently asked questions that we often get is, what is Atlas TI? Can Atlas TI do the analysis for me, especially in, in light of the AI coding? Why do I need Atlas TI? Manual coding seems better. And what other software is available? So in the first instance, if we look at Atlas TI, um, it is, of course, a really powerful software tool that assists you in data management and analysis. And it really is, first and foremost, a data management tool. So it offers a lot of functions that can help you code and analyze those data. Um, but really, it's the way in which it can be managed. I think it's a particularly attractive feature for researchers and researchers working in very large teams because it allows you to have multiple people working on the same project, so through the cloud-based feature that you can use with Atlas, but also creates a level of transparency to your data. So you can upload all of your raw documents uh, into data, uh, uh, into Atlas. So by raw documents, I mean your transcripts, your original audios, perhaps even your literature, um, image files or other audio files that you may have, geographical data it supports as well. And all of this can be uploaded into Atlas TI. Perhaps even your propo original proposal that you wrote related to your study. Everything can, everything can be brought into one project and stored in that way. The code, the analysis, everything. So in, in, an entire project can then be embodied within Atlas TI and can then be stored um, either on one of your own uh, cloud-based servers. So we know our ethics committee recommends Microsoft OneDrive, um, but of course, Atlas TI also has the cloud-based feature. Some people are often skeptical about uploading a project into the cloud, but Atlas TI has a password protect feature, which means you can you can protect the, um, the document or protect the file, really, um, then before you put it onto the cloud, and you can share the link and the password with uh, whoever is going to be collaborating on the project. So it is, of course, a computer-assisted data analysis software tool. And this term in particular um, was introduced uh, quite a number of years ago in 1991 already. So can Atlas TI do the analysis for me? And that's both a no and a yes. Um, for the purposes of um, perhaps initially just exploring the data, looking at perhaps common concepts that have emerged, um, so, so through auto coding, um, you, you may be able to, or, or even through generating a word cloud, um, which I can show you, um, you'd be able to see some of the common terms used. Um, you could do what Atlas TI calls opinion mining or sentiment analysis, um, or using the AI coding, which can then through you know the large language models um, run, you know, have them run through your your, your text and be able to offer some kind of uh, initial insights which you as a researcher or an Atlas TI user will then have to go and, and scrutinize and see whether what is being produced makes sense. So there are a number of automated features related to Atlas TI which can be useful to you, but um, you know, for the purposes of qualitative research and being able to look closely and in depth um, at your data, much of that will still be driven by you as the uh, as as the researcher. The coding, the links between the codes, how the codes may then um, become themes, um, and how the themes fit together into an overall narrative about your participants' insights into that um, particular research question. So there are. Um, you know, for, for the longest time, there's, there's been, I guess, ever since um, computer-assisted qualitative data analysis software emerged, there has been sort of these, um, um, this debate really about 
the extent to which um, these software tools are, are helpful or, or hindrances. Um, and I think we're starting to get to a point now where we certainly see that it's very much helpful, especially in the context of large studies with multiple sites, having people work together. But there are people who still very much prefer to, to stick to um, uh, analyzing data more manually. Um, and really, it's not actually to think about these as two mutually exclusive processes. I mean, for those of us who work with common uh, data analytic, um, qualitative data analytic um, methods and strategies like reflexive thematic analysis, for example, that very first phase, which is all about familiarization with the data, can happen either in Atlas or it can happen with you uh, printing out your transcripts, reading them, making notes and margins. Um, and then transferring this to Atlas TI, which may be quite a bit of work, so you may want to start online at first. Um, but at, but, but the, for the sake of preservation and transparency of the coding process, which may be something that examiners want to look at or reviewers want to look at in future, as it becomes more and more important to make your data available um, open access, then um, or to store it somewhere on open access repositories, and it may be helpful to use the software to be able to offer that kind of transparency to whoever may be wanting to look at it. So there are a number of pros and cons uh, to using it. But I think um, certainly as a as a um, as a trainer in the software, I, I will say there are a lot more pros. What other software is available? Um, quite a number actually. Uh, in vivo is quite popular and is used um, by um, students and staff at UCT in particular. Um, there's also uh, Max QDA, um, there's also Transana, and a number of others shown on the screen. So there's many others. We mostly support Atlas TI here at Stellenbosch, and um, for students and staff, there is a campus license available. So if you log onto the Atlas TI website, you can create an account. Once you create an account, you can also contact either your Marfa Marfa or IT in general, really to help um, connect you to the campus license, and then you you know you'll find your um, your your license uh, on on your Atlas TI um, on uh, on the web where you can create your account. So that is supported here, and as I mentioned, there's a number of us um, who actually offer training here, which I'll talk to you in a minute. So in terms of the resources, training and trainers, so how or where can I get it? So it is, it will be through atlasti.com, as I mentioned. Um, and here you would be able to sign up into my Atlas TI, which is in the top right hand corner. And um, if you don't have an account yet, you'll be prompted to create an account. Um, and then you would be able to see your, your license listed there. Not initially at first, you'll just contact IT for support there, but eventually you'll find your license listed there. Um, then in terms of how I can get Atlas TI, so again, this is just sort of what the, the login procedure would look like when you have an account. Um, and then eventually you'll be able to visualize um, your license through Salon Bosch's IT. And we have a campus license, which is really, really nice and it can, it's um, available forever basically and you will also automatically with that get all of the, the upgrades that that come and the most recent one has been at this ti 23. all right so in terms of the learning and support as i mentioned so this is a this is a screenshot of the youtube channel they have a number of videos playlists the broader community in which you can not only look at videos related to at this ti but also have a look at some really interesting videos on qualitative data analysis using Atlas TI that researchers have put up. And in addition to that, there is also the Atlas TI blog, um, which you can find through the main web page that um, is more of a descriptive um, play by play of how Atlas TI has been used in the research process to, to analyze data through um, either if it's a, a literature review or perhaps it was a narrative analysis or a grounded theory study um, or a phenomenological study more broadly. Um, it, you know, people have, have blogged about how they use Atlas in, in those processes, which is really, uh, really helpful to look at. 
Um, at the CI, as I mentioned, it can be quite an overwhelming um, program to engage with at first, and I'm not sure how many of you who are on the call have had an opportunity to engage with Atlas TI before. Um, some of you may be sitting here with quite a lot of Atlas TI expertise and just using this as a bit of a refresher. And some of you may have never opened the application before. Um, and so, you know, I would be able to, to present this afternoon Atlas TI from my perspective and, you know, and how I imagine it might be, might be useful to you. But there are a number of different interpretations and I think that um, one can easily feel overwhelmed with all of the various features, but know that the support is there. And so these, these two manuals are incredibly helpful. So there's a quick tour version of Atlas TI, which really is a, a nice um, quick tour. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a manual available online and you can click through the various sections and it takes you step by step from importing your documents right through to more complicated queries that you can perform on your data. And then there's also the much larger version, I think three or 400 pages of the Atlas TI user manual, which might take forever and a day to work through. Um, but perhaps you have more specific queries or more specific challenges that you've come across using the software, in which case you may find your answer in the more detailed manual and can have a look there. Then uh, for those of you who are interested perhaps in becoming trainers, and there's very there's different levels of trainers as well, or perhaps just um, wanting to demonstrate what either what you've learned here today or what you've learned through um, time spent with Atlas TI yourself, and you may want to just get access to sample projects that you can use, and I will use some of them today as well. Um, Atlas TI has a number of um, projects available, um, the bundles of which you can download and unpack, um, and I'll explain what bundle and unpack um, means for Atlas TI. Um, and that you can use um, in your demonstrations um, to, to showcase the various features of the software. Um, and then for those of you who are interested in actually becoming trainers in Atlas TI, you can find this information uh, on their website and it starts at a student level trainer and you can go all the way up until a senior level trainer if this is something that you're interested in doing. So social media platforms, it has as well. And then of course, um, a really excellent um, support center and support team who really are quite Colleagues, we seem to have lost um, contact with Bronwyn. Uh, we will try to get her back. It looks like she's trying to reconnect. So we will just wait until she has reconnected. Hi there, can everyone hear me? Yes, Bronwyn, we yes. lost you for a moment. Hey, you. Wow, sorry about this. I wish I had more control over that. <laughs> um, 
All right, let's let's pick up. Um, did did you lose me here at the overview? Bronwyn, I think so. Okay. All right. So um, let's have a look at what the interface looks like. So I have a couple of slides that are dedicated to just um, exploring the feature so we can see it more up close. Um, and after which I will then switch to the application um, and take you through um, a more practical demonstration of how to use some of the features. Right, so when you begin at the TI, um, you will eventually reach um, a landing page. And the landing page is very informative and has changed a lot over the years. Um, I really think it was probably around either at the TI version 9, I think 9, or perhaps even a, a later version of, of, of 8, where you began to see um, this type of landing page where on the left hand side here, you can see who you are as the user. So it says welcome Bronwyn. And then it also says here that this is where you can come to create a new project or import an existing project. And so um, by consulting even the, um, the quick tour manual, you'll see that Atlas TI can support um, uh, the projects that may have been created through previous versions of Atlas TI. Um, up until six, you know, from anywhere from version six onwards, the, the newer software can support those older projects. So it is quite important, I think, to if you do have projects that were created on earlier versions, to import them into the latest version and then to make copies of that and back it up. And so keep your um, projects all up to date and usable. Um, so it can. Um, here where it says your projects, it will also allow you to see your um, most recently used projects. Um, so they will all be listed here. And then it is from this space in particular where you can then upload a project onto the cloud and make it shareable to colleagues who, um, who are going to be collaborating on coding these data with you. Um, then what's also really helpful, and you'll see it's slightly changed, the information um, this gets updated all the time. It's a live stream of information that Atlas TI makes um, available on new and exciting features. So the most recent version of Atlas TI, you can see this is a 22 screenshot. Um, you'll see now when I open um, 2023, or version 23, that um, much of what will be listed here is actually related to the AI coding, because I think Atlas TI is one of the first um, qualitative data analysis software tools that has actually incorporated this into their um, um, into their uh, various functions. Um, then you get a quick access to all of their resources here, which is very useful. And then you can also um, scroll through the list at the bottom and find a tutorial related to something that you may be interested in exploring. So um, once you've gotten to um, this landing page, you will then decide you're either going to start a project from scratch. So this might be your master thesis, doctoral thesis. Um, it might be your research project um, for which qualitative data were collected um, or whatever you might want to use at the TI for, perhaps even for a literature review. You would then come and create the project here. And once you do so, you would then be able to name the project. So you can give it a name. And it's not compulsory to comment on the project, but I think if this is something that a project that you might be sharing with others who are collaborating with you, um, it might be nice also just for backing up purposes and for transparency later to just have a simple description of what this project is about and um, what one might find in it. Just um, that metadata I think is sometimes important to capture. Um, then as you click through, um, um, the, the information tab, you'll be able to see a couple of um, application preferences that you might like. Um, so, for example, you can choose um, the display language and the color theme and also um, the size of, of the font. Um, then you can also uh, click through the project preferences, which I'll do when I go um, into the application and just some information about your license, which is listed there. 
So this really is the main interface, and this is the, um, the interface that you will uh, be linking with quite often as you work through Atlas. Um, and so I will take you through each one of these um, tabs and, and, and speak a, a little bit about the features. So you'll see at the top we have file home, search and code, analyze important export tools and help. So what the developers of Atlas CI have done is they have tried to model it on other application packages that we may be familiar with. So this is the Atlas CI Windows version, which I'm demonstrating today. There is, of course, a Mac version as well, which might look slightly different to this one, um, but nonetheless have the same features, but the actual interface may look a little bit different. Um, and then, then there's also the, the cloud version. But you can you work from the cloud within this application, so you will download and upload projects from here. Um, so it is modeled on applications that we are more familiar with. So, you know, if you open up a Word document, it's also got these tabs and ribbons. And so you're able to see, have that familiarity, and they wanted to do that just to, to make things more, more user friendly. So um, if we have a look more closely at each of the tabs that I have just mentioned, in the file tab, this is especially where you will come if you want to save the project. Um, the snapshot here means that it just creates um, a smaller saved version of, of the project. Um, but really to be able to back this up, you, you would um, then do an ex export of the project bundle, which it's called, which is the entire project. So it's all of the um, information, all of the documents that you've uploaded into Atlas TI, plus all of the entities that you've created in Atlas TI, your codes, your networks, your memos, all of that will get bundled together and becomes this file that you can copy and store somewhere. So um, this is also where you would come to be able to um, set the password uh, on on your project, and this gives people a lot of um, um, secure, uh, makes people feel a little bit more secure in being able to share the project um, amongst uh, different users. Um, and it's also important for um, whether you share it through the cloud or whether you share the copy bundle through email, um, that you know you can use this password protect feature. And I think. Yeah, it would, would ethically, of course, be quite important. You can also come here to merge two projects. So now that we are able to work more collaboratively online through the cloud-based feature of Atlas DI, um, it, you know, it's becoming uh, less and less necessary really to merge two versions. So in the, in the past, before the cloud-based version, you would ideally have someone who had a master copy of the particular project that had all of the documents listed in it. And then that project would then be sent to your coders. Um, and then you would say you, you code documents 1 to 20 and you code documents 21 to 40. And then they would save those projects under different names. And then the person in charge of the project would then merge the two in order to be able to capture all of the codes across all of the documents. Um, but with the with the cloud-based feature, it means people can work more collaboratively. But where you might want to use that is still if you're interested in generating something like um, a Kappa coefficient for inter-rater reliability. So depending on which journals you're publishing, um, and if there were multiple coders on a project, they may be interested in knowing what uh, the level of agreement was between the codes created amongst the different coders. And in that case, you know, Atlas TI can support you working in a way so as to determine that intercoder agreement. It's not something that I will have time to go into too finely here, but nonetheless um, alerting you to that and we'll show you where you can find that uh, on the application a little later on. Um, in the home tab, you is also basically where you will spend most of your time. Um, here's where you will add your documents. Um, and I'll show you that you can add either single files or you can add a whole file. Um, and uh, you can also, um, you know, add your uh, audios or existing transcripts or whatever it may be through the Add Documents um, tab. This is also not the only place where you can add documents. So as I mentioned before, um, with Atlas, there are a number of uh, ways in which to do the same thing. So it's got quite redundant features in that way. Um, I'll talk um, more about each of these um, 
when I actually go into the application because then I can show you what it looks like when you click on those. Um, in terms of search and code, you'll see here this is where all the interesting stuff happens. Um, here you can uh, search and code for specific um, uh, words or expressions. You can test out sentiment analysis if it's something you're interested in exploring. Um, concepts or opinion mining, looking at word frequencies, which might be nice, especially for a content analysis. And then try your hand at AI coding. And I, I'll certainly demonstrate that um, just to show um, the, the difference between a researcher coded um, project um, versus the AI coded project and see how that compares. Um, you have a number of analytic tools, and this really is based on the way in which you code your data. So coding is a central feature and really the building blocks of everything else that you will do in Atlas TI. And your strategy and your method for coding in Atlas TI is very important um, if you want to be able to use some of these analytic tools. So the way in which you name codes or group codes, um, organize them, um, becomes important when you want to be able to check um, co-occurrence or, or create across a cross tabulation. Um, and we'll have a look at what that will look like. Then you can also import and export Atlas TI files, um, either import from various social, um, you know, um, there's social network comments and then there's also Twitter. You can import your, um, your web text file or, or related from your reference manager. So it's quite nice, especially if you have your PDF documents related to the references that you have and say, for example, Mendeley, then if you create an, um, an export in Mendeley to a book text file, you can then upload that into Atlas TI and it uses the metadata as well to create different groupings. Um, and I can show you what that what that will look like. Um, you can then also export to either SPSS or into a code book. Um, uh, using Atlas, which which can be useful. Um, then uh, a number of interesting tools. So it can it can mine your code list for any redundant coding. So it can help you streamline and refine your code list. Mm -hmm. And then of course it's got the help feature. And here again, um, you have access to the manuals through the quick tour um, and the help function in particular. You can connect with a live chat. So as you're busy, if someone's online, um, and usually there is, you can actually engage in live chat for problem solving support and then go on to YouTube as well to watch some of their amazing videos. And they have um, they have almost weekly, if not daily, repeat seminars in which they go through the introduction and the various features. So there's really a wealth of online support. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so, Bronwyn, sorry yes. to stop you. There's a few questions here. Um, is there a free version of Atlas or do you need a subscription? And with that, um, how do you become a trainer? Is there a cost to training for a person who wants to be an expert? OK. Um, in terms of a free version, there's a free trial version available. So you can have full access to Atlas TI for a set period of time and you can access the trial version online. Um, but as mentioned, if you're a staff or student of Stellenbosch, you can have access to the full version through the campus license that um, Stellenbosch has with Atlas TI. Um, it took years to get that campus license, so please use it. <laughs> um, then in terms of wanting to become a trainer, again, that information um, is on the website. And as far as I know, and from my own experience, there's no cost involved in that for individuals who are interested. I don't know if, if there are any other questions. Any other, another question by Mr. Knutzer, would the project contain all data for one particular study or should components of a re research study be broken into different projects? I guess that will ultimately um, be the decision of the researcher, but in my experience, it's it's far better to contain everything related to one project in one Atlas TI fol uh, folder. So um, let's say, for example, you've collected 
um, data in multiple ways. So you may have um, uh, or interview transcripts, or you may have images, or you may have observations, or you may, you know, have uh, whatever else you've been using. Um, all of that data will come into one Atlas TI project. So all of all of that information will be imported at the same time, rather than having a different project for the interviews and a different project for the images and a different project. So that wouldn't make sense um, in, in that sense if, if, if you were meaning it in that way, um, because ultimately through your coding, you'd want to see what the commonalities are across the different data sources. So you would want to keep everything in one project. Um, and that's uh, and, and everything relates to the project that may be usable um, with Atlas TI features, with qualitative data analysis features, recommended to keep that in, in one project and keep everything together. Yes, uh, Bronwyn, that's all for now, so you can continue. Thank you. Um, so I thought I might share what the overview of the research process, um, or an overview of the research process, but just you know some ideas I think of how Atlas TI can help along the way. Um, and so we're, we're all familiar with this journey. You'll begin with a research question, um, which will then lead to your research proposal, your ethics application. You'll then collect those data, analyze the data, write them up, and then disseminate your findings. So the way in which Atlas TI might help to support this is by thinking of those different steps and by thinking of what you might want to do with, um, with uh, the software tool to support each of those steps. So for example, you know, as part of your proposal and ultimately as part of your final write-up, so especially if this is a, a, a thesis or a dissertation, um, you may be able to use Atlas TI to support your literature review. And so maybe at another stage I can um, uh, post a webinar on how to use Atlas TI for literature review. And, and, and you know, that might be sort of an hour or so to take you through that. Um, but you can begin to use the features to import and organize your literature. So here in particular it would be helpful um, if you have uh, been using some kind of uh, referencing software, either Mendeley or Zotero, um, RefWorks um, um, or, or any of those uh, uh, any of those uh, software programs, um, because you can then bring those those important references in, and they may be linked to. So often, some of the metadata that these uh, software programs can collect is the abstract that may be available for that for that paper, um, and then also if it's open access, perhaps the article itself, um, or if you can't find it to use. The library databases and then connect that article to the reference, keep it all together. Otherwise, if you don't use a reference manager, you can just import your um, on your computer where your literature file may be. You can import those PDFs um, into Atlas TI, um, and then you just um, you know spend a little bit of time on just how you name those documents. So you might want to reflect the year and the author and perhaps the title in the journal, um, and then you can use the Atlas TI grouping fe feature to have perhaps all of your um, 2020 articles together, 2021, 2022, and then begin to code, because um, begin to code your, your, your literature, um, especially if you want to be able to synthesize that into what were some of the commonalities or, or the discrepancies in the literature. And then when you create an output, the output can then be listed chronologically if you um, if you've labeled your document in that way, and it can give you a nice quick overview um, of sort of the main findings by year in which you coded. So that's quite a nice feature. So you can import your references as well, as I mentioned, because it has those features. Um, organize your documents, code them, and create outputs. Then, in terms of your actual date, um, it. Uh, Atlas TI supports you uploading documents in various formats, video files, MP3, MP4, um, so video and audio, your text documents. You may have done transcription in other software programs and want to bring those transcripts into Atlas. It, it's probably likely to support that. Um, 
and uh, you can import uh, geographical data if that's important to you. So really, it, it supports a number of formats. And um, you can bring all of those documents together. And then you can even organize those um, documents into different groupings. So you can see which were my interviews, which were my focus groups. Um, if you have, a, uh, have an open-ended survey that you want to import, you can also do that. Um, then in terms of data collection, so often when, uh, once we've completed interviews or focus groups, we then also want to be able to transcribe our data. And so NSTI is not in a position yet where it does automatic transcription. I'm sure that will come soon. Um, there are other ways in which that can be done, perhaps not as accurately as we would want, which may be, you know, if you're doing online interviews, to use Microsoft Teams like we're using this afternoon, although the quality of the Teams transcriptions is debatable. <laughs> um, I think it's always interesting uh, how, what it picks up, but nonetheless, some people find it useful to rather edit an existing transcript um, than to start from scratch. So if that appeals to you, you can do that, copy and paste it into Word, and then upload it into Atlas TI for analysis. Um, but otherwise, um, I will show you how you can use Atlas TI to upload an audio file and, and a Word file and then to, to link these two for transcription. So you can do transcription manually within Atlas. Um, you can then also add your field notes using a memo function or a comment function. So um, I'll talk a bit about the memo as well. Um, and then when you think about your data, analysis and your write-up is the last step there. Um, and these are just a, a couple of things that came to mind. There are obviously many other ways in which uh, data analysis can be supported through Atlas, but these are some of the more typical ones. So you can organize your data into document groups. So you will have documents, you will have quotations, you will have codes, and you can have memos. And so your documents are the actual um, transcripts or audio files or video files uh, or image files that you in, uh, import into Atlas. And you can organize these various documents into different groups. So say, for example, you've got interviews um, with older versus younger people or with children, adolescents and those in early adulthood. And you may want to just create categories or, or, or groupings of all of um, the individuals who meet um, the criteria for being um, an, uh, an adolescent or an early adult, or you might want to have groupings of your interview transcripts by age. Um, so you may want to spend some time just to think about how might I want to group my documents. Um, because again, if you're thinking about the final output, so after you've completed all of the coding, you may want to ask Atlas TI to make very specific outputs for you. So you may be interested in, for example, for example, if you've done a lot of coding around barriers to adherence to medication taking, you may be interested in understanding what adolescents, so 12, 13, 14 year olds, had to say about some of the barriers that they experienced specifically. And if you've created those groupings and the codes for that, you can then create a very specific output rather than having to go through all of those codes again. So Atlas TI can support that. So that's really why it's a fantastic um, data management uh, tool in allowing you to ask more specific questions and to get more specific outputs, which ultimately then is related to how you've, how you've coded your data. So it is worthwhile spending a little bit of time on thinking through some of those initial phases around um, that familiarization phase around how I might want to organize the groupings of, of my documents and then my codes as well. So then also part um, of the analysis and which really is uh, an almost universal feature across many data analysis um, strategies in qualitative research is to read, listen, make notes, um, highlight, um, and I say uh, uh, highlighting here through the quotation feature um, because you can, what's nice about Atlas TI, and I'm not sure if Invivo supports this as well, but it allows you to create free quotations. So you may be working through a particular document and you just want to be able to highlight bits of text that are interesting, but you may not yet know what you want to code it. But Atlas TI can nonetheless 
capture those free quotations for you and you can add a code to them at a later stage once you are a bit more familiar with your documents. And then you can code your data either inductively, so be data driven um, by what participants themselves have said, or you can work deductively where you may be wanting to code or fit the data to a particular theory or framework. Um, and so you as a researcher will decide what is most useful to you in terms of your approach uh, to the analysis. Once you've then created your code list um, or you've completed a round of coding on all of your transcripts, so say for example you had 10 interviews, you've done one round of coding across all 10 interviews and you are sitting now with over 500 or 600 codes. That sounds like a lot, but I have seen projects where after two interviews um, there are about 400 codes. So we often talk about a fine coder versus a monster coder. And so your fine coder is someone who might find um, every line interesting. So that might be someone who's then naturally themselves a grounded theorist. Um, or you may be a monster coder where you have more general uh, labels applied uh, to the data and have far fewer codes. Um, and so it's actually helpful to be a little bit, have a little bit of a, a balance between the two, um, especially um, within Atlas. So ultimately, you would then come to review your list and Atlas TI has features for where you can merge codes together. So you will review um, as is part of many qualitative data analysis steps. Um, you have to review your list and you have to refine it before you reach that, that final code list. And so Atlas TI can allow you to merge and split, create groups. It's got a wonderful feature known as the network function, which allows you to visualize your codes in the network space where you can begin to draw um, arbitrary links between your codes. So you can create relationships between them, not, not uh, relationships in, in the quantitative sense, but rather just as a way to sort of map thematically and theoretically how you think the codes or the pieces of information that you've identified link together. And you can do this within the network space and you can have with it a memo and you can begin to document some of your thoughts um, related to how your codes fit together which can ultimately form the basis of the results section of whatever it is you're working on your paper your thesis your dissertation so um, we'll talk a little bit more about those so i thought i would also just recap um sort of uh, i should make this more specific reflexive thematic analysis especially given the memo function um, in Atlas TI. But um, for those of you who aren't familiar with thematic analysis, it is a popular data analysis um, strategy that's used. Um, yeah, it's probably one of the most common. Um, and you have the authors, um, Braun and Clark, so um, uh, Virginia Braun and Victoria Clark, who write about uh, thematic analysis, which is an umbrella term. Um, and has as part of thematic analysis both reflexive thematic analysis and also then framework analysis as, 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 as part of this umbrella. But just uh, to not go into too many details there, I just thought that I would show how um, you may apply that. So um, in the first instance, so this, this uh, sketch here is quite busy, so I'll rather just go into phase one, which is your um, so thematic analysis has six steps or six phases that they talk about. And the first thing is that familiarization with the data and organizing the data for the analysis. And so in Atlas TI, you can organize and prepare the content by using document groups, by using coding groups, by um, naming your documents in a certain way to support the analysis. Um, think about how you transcribe. Um, Think about how you label your transcripts um, and what sort of yeah you know, and what sort of groupings you you may want. In terms of phase two, which is all about coding all of the um, all of the data, so a code is then that concept that is um, assigned and determined either inductively or deductively based on whether you think it's going to be useful um, to answer the research question. And you can then, so this is an example of a code list from Atlas TI given here. So you can see that there's sort of, um, you know, um, main headings created here just to be able to organize the code list. This person has created 
are heading for activities and benefits and best friends. Um, and then also used um, these prefixes like activities and then, and then demonstrating what kinds of activities um, as a way to organize the code list. So organization is quite uh, important in ATSDI. Then um, generating your themes. So you may then from your code list be able to create code groups and those code groups may or may not be themes. You may want to create a code group just for the sake of exploring a few codes together. Um, or you may be specifically creating code groups because you are saying that um, these codes belong together under a more broad um, theme or idea. Um, you can then use the network space. And so this is what the network space would look like with all of your codes, the links that you've created that explores the relationship between the codes. And you can use this as a place where you can come and review your themes and, and have a look at all of the um, quotations that belong to a particular theme and see whether they actually fit together um, or whether you need to do any, any more work there. And then lastly would be the write-up, which you can do using the memo feature, or you've probably been using the memo, the memo feature throughout your um, coding project, and then you can just copy and paste all of that into a Word document and it can form the basis you know, of your analysis. And then you can also generate a number of, of reports along the way, and those reports are especially useful for those specific queries you want, might want to create. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, you may be interested in what young teens had to say about um, barriers to adherence to medication taking. And you can filter out those codes and those responses um, through, through a code report. All right, so you do think about at the TI as your project container and or, or a box. And so everything that relates to that project then um, can go into one in, into one project. So yeah, let's explore. So I'm just going to exit here and then go uh, into the application. I'll share my screen again in a minute. All right, you should be able to see my desktop. So I'll launch the application. All right, so just to check, can everyone see the desktop? Yes, we can. Right, yes, Bronwyn, we can. So here we have, um, this is the interface. So you remember this from my slide. So once you've launched the application, so um, this sort of interface um, you'll see in front of you. So this is, where you come to interact with Atlas TI. So you'll see, um, as I mentioned, that the news here has changed a bit. It's all about AI now and about the, the upcoming conference, the Seventh World Conference on Qualitative Research. And for those of you who are qualitative researchers on the call, you probably know about this conference already, or if not, have a look. Um, it's sure to be quite interesting. So here is some of the latest news. And you can see this was actually published um, in November last year about the Atlas TI AI Lab, which is continuously working to empower your research with a range of AI-driven technologies. Um, and it is exciting uh, and, and interesting to use. And I'll show you a little bit about what that entails, but um, please do not be mistaken. <laughs> you will still have to have to have a very close look um, at how it's coding the data and use your judgment as a researcher and the experts on the topic to decide whether this is useful uh, or not. Um, but it is a it is a step towards um, uh, I guess having um, having uh, the data automatically coded um, and, and not to stray too much off of the topic. But then one has to ask yourself, you know, what then is the ro role of the researcher? <laughs> but I think that's only a question for far in the future. So um, once you've reached this landing page. Um, you then have your two options, and I'll quickly show what, what that would entail. So the first is then to create a new project. So I may just call this um, the Library Research Week 2023. 
I see the question there about how do I upgrade from 22 to 23. So if you've got version 22, if you launch the application, it should take you to version 23. And if it doesn't do that, you can then just go onto adlibti.com to where you find your license online um, and you can upgrade there. And if that if that still doesn't work, then you can just connect um, with IT at Stellenbosch um, to, to help you with the upgrade. Um, and then you might want to comment that the demo at least TI version 20. All right, and then you will click create. And once you click create, you yeah, you're then able to land on this page. So you can see there's the comment that you created and you can edit to click this uh, um, click to edit this comment at any time. And so if this is your thesis, um, I always say this, but one of the best <laughs> one of the best master thesis titles uh, for an Atlas TI project um, that I came across in one of my trainings was um, or the young student who who labeled their project um, my life's work. I love that, and um, I hope to use that as a name for one of my projects in the future, but it was quite sweet. And so this will be, um, this usually students will say MA thesis, data analysis, or doctoral thesis analysis, or whatever you want to call it, maybe for a specific project, um, it's helpful, especially if you're sharing this amongst others to have a look at, or you may want to, to back it up for the future. Um, let me give you a quick snapshot of, um, whether you have any um, uh, documents, codes or quotations, memos or networks related to this project yet. And of course, this is a brand new project, so I don't have anything linked to it yet. All right, and it gives you some other met metadata about whether it was mod modified, who the user is, the version, um, and who created it. All right, so then on the left-hand side, yeah, and remember everything in Atlas TI is adjustable. You can adjust the margins to, um, you know, to whatever suits you. Um, and you can just about comment uh, on anything in Atlas TI as well. You can create a comment about a comment, I'm sure you can. So these are the tabs that I then um, went through in the screenshots. And the first one then is file. So here you would be able to set the password for your project um, if you want to. And like most features you have to I'm just going to delete this here because I'm not going to create a password. And then you can set that before you actually share it with, with other users. In terms of new, um, you can hear if, if I um, complete this and I create a new project, then a new Atlas TI window will open up, a new interface, and there you would put something else. So how would you create a new project um, if everything is uh, you know, if all of the documents are, are related to one thing, I would create new project for different research projects that I have. Um, you can also import there, and I'll show you what that looks like in the next step. Um, you can open. So this um, shows you your most recently opened project. You've got save. Um, as I mentioned, snapshot. Um, you can create just a, um, a quick snapshot of something you've been working with, but it's probably always best to export your project bundle. So after every coding exercise, just as a way to back things up, I would say um, come and create a project bundle here and then just use the date um, to distinguish between the different versions and just keep those um, backed up somewhere. It's a lot harder these days to lose your Atlas TI project and data than it was with the earlier versions like 4.2. Um, for example, if you just moved where the file was um, or slightly moved, you know, um, at some point I felt if I just moved it from left to right, then it would have an issue. But, uh, it, you know, there's a lot more support now to be able to trace back and find your project should something happen when you're working across different devices. And of course, the Atlas TI um, support team will encourage you to at least back it up on the cloud, um, especially if you are wanting to work across multiple devices. This is the merge function that I spoke about, where you can have um, merged two um, projects together. So you may have the same set of data, but the transcripts were split between two coders. 
they coded them independently with the same set of codes, and now you want to bring those together, and you can use the merge project bundle um, to facilitate that. So it will show all of the projects that um, are available for merging here. Um, and then you also have a couple of options. So I showed this. You can um, change your color theme. If you want to work in dark mode or light mode, um, and you can also zoom at this TI a little bit more. So maybe just for today, I will zoom in a bit. Um, you've got some project preferences, which you can click through. Um, I won't change anything here, but um, it, it asks whether you wanted to remember the size and the position of the project window and how you want to open projects. So do you want it to automatically launch the following navigation tools and use them? And it's best really to keep most of these on never, because if you do open up the app at file, you just suddenly see all of these little windows pop up and it can be very um, confusing. So I think the standard settings um, are perfect. Then yeah, under Atlas TI, you can get all of the information um, about your options and preferences, as well as your license version information. And you can even click and check for updates here. So for, um, for the participant who asked about the license, perhaps if you open 22, you may see the upgrade to 2023 here as well. Um, and then yeah, uh, exit if you want to exit the project. OK. So that was the file tab and the next tab is home. So this really is where you will come and spend most of your time. You'll see that what's available at the top here is also really duplicated on the left here. So you have this nice explorer view. So once you begin to add documents, once you begin to add codes, you'll see the zero here change it to, to demonstrate how many of each are available. You can then see that you can also, for each of the individual entities, as they are called, um, your entities are your folders, your codes, memos, networks. For each of the individual entities, you then you are then also able to group these entities um, into document groups, code groups, memos, networks, and multimedia transcripts. So you can comment on the project, so we've already done so. The navigator, again, You've got the same features as listed here. So this is what I meant when I said it looks like a lot, and that's because actually much of it is quite redundant. I guess they try to also cater to different ways in which people might explore or navigate things. So for example, I like to right click on ev everything, and I always say if in doubt, right click, um, because you, you're able to access many of the features through right clicking as well. And I'll, I'll demonstrate that when I when I show some coding. So I guess they just try to make as many options available and so that you can find the, the level of um, comfort that suits you when you work. All right. Then um, you've got your managers and these are quite um, important. So your document manager, for example. Oh, so, and as I clicked on that, it reminded me that um, in Atlas TI, you, you honestly really never have to remember what something does because if you hover over an icon, you get almost um, an essay of a description on what it entails. So, if I hover over documents here, you can see the document manager provides an overview of all the documents and groups um, and so on. So, it really gives. Um, uh, a rich description of all of the different um, items here. So you know, true to qualitative style, there's always a thick description of the various features. So um, the next is your, so if you click on the, the document manager, this is where you will see um, where you can come and add your documents, uh, your files, folders, um, and your files may be audio files and your files may be video files. And so sometimes those files can be very large. So instead of then bringing that full file into Atlas TI, it also gives you the option then to link a video and audio. And so perhaps the first one that I can sort of demonstrate here is to add a video or, an, or sorry, an audio. Um, so let me just navigate. My materials, my audio for transcription. This is one of my, an Afrikaans recording made by the translations office for one of my lectures, so I will not be playing it. 
Um, and I might then want to import um, the transcript. If I can go back, I can go to Document Manager as well. There you'll see that it showed I can I have imported the audio for transcription. And then I can also, with a document, import a transcript. So this is one way in which you can import the transcript, or you can follow the exact same steps as you had before. That within the document manager, you can add a document, search for the file. And so here, this is the document uh, related to this audio that I created, and I can open it. So now I have I can have these two together. And I'm able then to listen to the audio for a short while. <laughs> uh, let's not listen to it in too much detail. Pause and then go to my document and actually um, click on edit. So that I can then um, begin transcription. Right, so this is then how you can um, use Atlas TI to, to facilitate your transcription. And you can save and exit edit mode, and these then become um, two documents that will be listed um, in the document manager. So another way to do this would then be to be able to, um, in the multimedia transcript, so if we do it again, you can then say, uh, bring in the audio, Ideally, you don't want to have to do this twice. Import the transcript. So now I've imported the transcript within the window that automatically opened when I um, selected on bring the audio in for transcript. And so here I'm able then to go and find that document, open it up, and import. And so here it will actually add the document that you can edit to complete your transcription as a multimedia file here at the bottom. So it, it, it doesn't matter which way it incorporates it, as long as you can see both the audio as well as the, the file related to it. So I'll just delete two of them so that um, there's not too much noise here, but that was just sort of roughly how you would um, bring, bring that in. So then this is how you would um, input any of your documents. So again, if we're home, um, if we're in the document manager, you will add documents, other uh, individual files, or add a folder content as well. I've got a folder called literature here, so I might want to select this folder, and it will add all of the documents, so all of my literature um, that I might be interested in. All right. Any questions on this so far? On adding documents. Um, navigate to the chat. Okay. All right. So, just to stay with the document manager and for us just to put our minds back to the diagram that I showed, where, um, you know, using Atlas TI to support the research process. Um, in the very first instance, you may then have collected your data, you'll transcribe your data. Those data will typically be transcribed then in Word documents, so you'll want to, to bring your interviews in. So, um, or you may have your literature, so you may have um, your uh, different PDF files that, that you want to bring in here. But you can see that it starts to look a little bit messy and you want to organize it, um, just to be able to show the, the various groupings of documents. So I can also add um, what might be my interviews. So if I go um, and just find this is more blogs, let's try um, interview transcripts. Okay, I'm bringing in some Word documents that, that are that are interviews, and so I have now a number of different kinds. Uh, of media types in here. I've got text, um, I've got PDF, and I've also got audio. So now I want, I might want to create just, uh, just to organize this a little bit in Atlas. So I can select all of the documents that I want. So all I'm doing is just selecting, and then I drag and drop to this open window. And 
I can then call this my. Um, it's a bit stuck there. It doesn't usually do that, but I can call this my literature review. Or just the literature. And say create. Then I can also organize the following. And I might say that these are my interviews. So this is quite. Um, yeah, this is quite, uh, you know, this is not really a sophisticated grouping. I would say that what would probably be a little bit more helpful is if you could say, and that's dependent on if you've labeled your documents in a way to, to help you. So here I know Deborah, for example, is female, Alexander, for example, is male. I might want to do um, add here the dates which the interview was done or even the age of the participants, and these can help you to create different groupings. So I can then say, for example, these were the female interviews. Um, or that you know, these are the male interviews. And so I can begin to organize uh, my data into groups. And why this is important is because ultimately when you have coded all of your data, you may be interested in um, being able to set a filter on that particular group, which means that when you create a report um, of your codes, you can then make it specific to that particular group so it can filter out all of the other um, all of the other codes. Um, so Megan says, can a document be placed into more than one group? Yes, it can. So you can have, for example, so if I remove that and I don't show the filtering, I can, for example, um, drop you know, the. Um, so here you would see the interviews and male interviews are together. Um, you can then have female interviews in the literature uh, or in the male interviews. So, you know, however it might be useful to you. So, yes, you can have more uh, a document to place into more than one group. OK. So that's more or less how you would go about uploading your documents. So you can then do it through your document manager, as I've shown here. I can just close the manager again, or I can simply do it here just through add documents. And so there's multiple ways in which you can add documents to, to add this tab, but those are the two most common through the document manager or even through here. You can have a look. Um, and then through the add documents feature on the home tab. OK. So um, the next uh, manager is called your quotation manager. And as I mentioned, Atlas TI allows two entities when you code. So it allows you to create a free quotation, which would mean the following. So if I opened one of the documents, let's say we have a look at Deborah's interview. If I'm interested in um, coding, um, all right, so this is that you're ready to start so that we can you know, set that sort of your consent stuff. Um, then I might be interested in, for example, let's just say coding this. And I'm reading through the quotes. It says I thought it was quite cold, but it's like, OK, so what, what is it that you're studying at uni? And she says applied psychology. All right, so I might want this whole piece. Um, but I'm not sure what it is that I want to code this yet. All right, so I'm allowed then to create a free quotation, which means I don't have to immediately assign a code to it, which is nice. So this is a nice feature because it's going to allow me to mark this quotation. And then um, I can then go into the quotation manager and then assign codes there if I want to. So here I can create a free quotation either simply by clicking right here. Um, or as I mentioned earlier, um, for me, if in doubt, right click. So you can do almost anything by right clicking and then create free quotation. And you can see that it's simply just marked the instance um, where you have found a piece of information that's interesting to you. So if you go back to the home tab and you go to your quotation manager, you'll see those two codes listed there, but there, there aren't any uh, codes assigned to it yet. So um, you may then want to think about um, creating some codes in which you can then create a code right here. So you then read through what each of these um, labels are. 
or you can read uh, through the preview at the bottom here, and you can then decide what you might want to code it. So I'm not going to try and come up with any creative code names right now. So I'll simply just say code A and create, and then I can just link this to code A. And then I can read the next bit. OK, so you're doing just psychology. So then I might call this something else, code B. Of course, you need to come up with interesting code names that's relevant to your research. And you click create, and then I can simply just connect it there. And so you'll see here, if I just navigate to the left hand side to the explore, I can see that I've created two codes now. You'll see in the curly brackets that you've got two values there, a one and a zero. So the first one is your is your, um, uh, your groundedness, which is your frequency, how many times the code has been used. And then the second one is the density, which is the number of times that code has been linked to another code. So right now, for the sake of this presentation, we'll just be interested in frequency. So I know that I've only used, or I know that for this particular code, code A, I've only got one quotation attached to it. And for code B, I've also only got one quotation attached to it. All right. So that's, um, you would then, now that you've created two codes, it means that if you navigate back to the home tab, you'll see that um, from your quotation manager, I'm just going to close Deborah there. From your quotation manager, you can see your codes, but from your code manager, you can see code A and code B, your groundedness and your density, and whether you've created any code groups yet. So again, if you just, if you think back to the research steps in that diagram, um, once you've completed a round of coding, the code manager is where you will come back. The code manager is where you will come and review all of your codes and try and see whether you need to um, merge any codes or split any codes, and you begin to refine the code list. But the other important thing that you begin to do is then create some code groups, which for you may then be a theme. So creating a code group doesn't mean it has to be a theme. You, you know, you can, you can create code groups for the sake of uh, creating code groups, but um, most people, when they are selecting various codes that they want to bring together into a code group, they often do so because they want it to reflect a particular theme. So let's say, for example, that I believe that code A and code B fit together, sort of, um, and either theoretically or just based on the information that they uh, hold, then I'll drag and drop, same as what we did with the document group manager, and let go and call this, let's call this theme one, just for the sake of demonstration. All right, so I saw um, a comment um, about what is meant by groundedness and density. So groundedness, um, another word for groundedness is simply frequency. So it's the number of times that um, code has been used. So we know code A is currently only linked to one quotation. Code B is also only currently linked to one quotation. And density is the number of times that um, a code has been linked to another code. So let's say, for example, I want to link code A and B. And this is something that you would do when you have a number of codes. And you have a number of you have these codes that may come together in into a theme, and you may want to explore how these codes fit together. To you know, it may be all, all of the codes and the, and the quotations related to theme one. So um, initial experiences of a diagnosis or um, understandings of the concept of mental health, for example. So, you know, perhaps you have this all grouped together into what, what will become one theme. Um, and you can then go into the network view. And you can then begin to explore. So I'm hoping everyone saw where I clicked that. So I'm in the code manager here and just at the top is show network. And you can click on that. And you can then come and have a look at those codes. So again, if in doubt, right click. If I right click on A, I can say add neighbors and quotations. So I can have the quotation there. Same for code B. And I can come and read these two 
expectations and, and, and try to understand what's happening here and whether it fits on um, code Bs. Um, then if I want to, because we're talking about groundedness and density, the, the density is related to the extent to which a code has been linked to another code. So you'll see I've selected code B here and there's a box that becomes available and I can drag and drop um, my wonderful mouse. Let's hope that it can end somewhere. So I can drag and drop the two and then it can ask you um, how, you know, what sort of relationship do they have? And remember, this is this is qualitative research, so it's not trying to make anything quantitative here. So especially with links like is a cause of or whatever, it just, I mean, you can add um, information, you can add your own kind of relation if, if the one you have here isn't, um, one you want isn't listed here. But let's say that, you know, they might contradict one another, so it just becomes a nice label that you can use. And so if I go to my code manager, you'll see the density changes to one and one because each of these codes have now been linked to one another. All right, so that's um, that's really the, the difference between the groundedness and okay. So oh, I don't need to save this. So just going back, you then also have, so we've spoken a little bit about documents. Remember, we won't be able to cover everything in its entirety. Two hours is not long enough. We usually host two to three day workshops <laughs> on an introduction to Atlas. Um, so we've spoken a bit about the, the document manager, the quotation manager, and how that might be to you with free quotations, and then later on adding a quotation. We've seen where we can come and find our codes. And then something about the memos. So originally when Atlas TI was developed, it was actually model based on some key principles of grounded theory. So open coding, axial coding, selective coding, um, and then, as Shamaz and colleagues have often written about the importance of memoing and about writing the thinking and about having a, a space in which you can write about the coding that you um, are doing and about um, the, the, the insights that you gain from, from your data. And so the developers of Atlas TI wanted to bring this memoing function into Atlas TI so that you don't have to leave the software to use a Word document or a notepad to capture your thoughts um, and sentiments, that you can rather just come and create a memo where you can um, capture all of your thoughts. So you can create a free memo and you can, you can create, uh, call it a research diary or an analytic memo, or, or perhaps the memo is named based on the particular theme that you're exploring, and you cre can create it. And then we can just edit it and um, begin to capture your thoughts. And so this is quite nice um, because what you can also eventually do, um, and it's going to be easier for me to show you when I open up the other project, but you can link a memo to the network. And so when, you, when, you're, when you're displaying a network, which is a collection of codes, and you might want to figure out how those codes fit together. You can then have your memo right there and capture your thoughts as you're making the links between them. Um, but when I when I open up an existing project, um, I, I can speak more about that. OK. So I'm just closing here again. I'm not going to save my memo. Um, the last um, second last here is really about the networks. So we've We've uh, touched on the network a little bit, but you can create the network. Uh, we can keep it new network. And uh, when it opens up, it'll say there's no entities in here, but I can always drag and drop the codes just from my list here that I think might be important, and I can come and create a network here. Um, okay. So, Lastly, then you've just got your links and so far I've actually only created one link, which is between code A and code B, and I call this relationship contradicts. And really, when you're engaging in your project and you've created various codes and you bring those codes together into code groups and you want to explore those code groups in the network, 
we can draw these arrows and links between them to facilitate your writing and thinking about that thing. So as you see the codes in the space, think about how they relate to one another and use the links and arrows to create this thematic map from which you can then either write your memo or immediately put that into the results section um, of, of the piece that you're working on. So it's, it's a nice space to then come and draw um, and, and bring some clarity to some of the thoughts you have about how your codes might speak to or be linked to one another. Then, um, so these are your managers and these really are some of your most important features. All right, so in the next tab, we've got search and code. So we've got just an ordinary um, text search. So if I click on that, it will ask me um, whether I want to look at a particular document or a group of documents, or perhaps I want to look at a group of documents. It seems to cut off at the bottom here. Um, okay. Continue, and it says enter the search term that you want to look at. Um, uh, this would mean some familiarity with um, with your documents. I don't know. I think there was. Let's just look for interviewer and add that. Um, and you can add a number of other search terms as well. And then you can just click next. Um, and it will find this is you know, exactly what it does. Just like in a Word document or PDF, Control F, search word, this is exactly what the text search does. All right. Close that. Um, you can also just look for a regular expression. So, in the same way as that, you can select um, a grouping of documents or you can just select um, one document in particular and continue and you can search for um, uh, any kind of, and it, and it says exactly here what you can search for um, that you might uh, want to have a look through across um, the transcript. Okay, so goes there. Then you can do a named entity recognition, which, and again, if you hover over it to tell you exactly what it will do, it will find words or sentences or paragraphs, um, and there's a relevant uh, text search, which is enhanced by synonym detection um, and powered by machine learning. Okay, so all of these um, text, uh, analy text analysis options here are really based on language and machine learning models. So name entity recognition is probably not one you use as often as perhaps sentiment uh, analysis. So um, in terms of sentiment analysis, it will actually go through your interviews for you. And it will decide whether what it's finding in the information has a positive, a negative or a neutral sentiment. And so you can then, once it's coded the sections that it has deemed positive, negative or neutral, Use the research you can go and look at those specific sections of the text and decide, you know, whether this might be useful in your analysis or not. So again, you know, I might want to look across all of my interviews. And um, then uh, I might go next. And I can then have, have a look through all the paragraphs and it shows you positive. So if it finds a positive sentiment, what is the code that you wanted to use? You can change these um, depending on what your needs are. And so then I can show the results, search these through all my documents. And you can see then that it's automatically coding here. But before it does, it allows you to check through everything that it's created and it you can then say apply proposed codes or do it one by one. So apply codes. So you can then um, say either you apply your own codes, code A or code B, or apply this proposed code, which is the, the actual sentiment analysis. Okay, and you can decide, correct, that might be neutral, um, and then do it for each one of these, say positive or neutral or whatever. So um, and then it will uh, also then automatically code that um, for you when you click on there. And then you can change the, the preview size. So, I mean, again, this is 
you know, this is your decision to make as a researcher, whether using a tool like sentiment analysis might make sense for you or not, but nonetheless knowing that this is available to you. All right, so these are these will be all of your sentiment codes here. And it's automatically then organized it into what it found as negative, 236, neutral, 413, one positive. Okay. Um, the next type of way in which you can analyze a text is asking you to find certain concepts. So you may want to search for a concept or idea, um, and it can it can have a look at that for you. So if you if you're interested in what some of the concepts might look like, um, you can just click on the document and it creates a little word cloud uh, cloud for you on the most commonly used words within those documents. And so. You might want to do it one document at a time to see what comes up as important. And then it shows you, if you click on the word friend, it's going to show me here all of the places where friend was used. And it's also created for me a code that I can use um, if I want to, to label these. So it, it suggests a couple of codes for you to use if this might be useful to you. So that's the way in which it can mine for different concepts. So create little word counts for you. This is particularly nice for something like a content analysis uh, for each of your documents. You can come and see what is the, you know, the most frequently used words, or you can search for um, specific concepts that you may be interested in, and then go ahead and code them as well. All right, so the next would be opinion mining. So I'm just going to close all of these. Um, the next would be opinion mining. And this is also quite interesting. So I may um, just click on Deborah again, picking on Deborah today. And we'll determine some opinion mining terms. And this, again, you know, this is based on machine learning and language models, and it goes through that piece of text that it's just um, analyzed, and it might you know, um, come up with some ideas about what might be might, might be important there. So again, you can come and click through each of these and see if, if this is um, useful to you in any way. Um, then word frequencies, um, this is going to give you um, basically a word cloud um, or a word list, depending on how you want to visualize it. But just a standard word cloud. People like using these, especially when they have, um, for example, if you upload your student feedback into Atlas TI and the narrative bits, and you might want to create a word cloud for your teaching portfolio, um, or you may just want to show students some of the feedback that they've given you through a word cloud and show what were some of the words that they use most often or less. Or in other spheres of research, if you know if you've done a nice um, focus group or you want to do some dissemination work. Um, to see what participants word they use most freely to, you know, um, most frequently to describe an intervention or some of the activities that they took part in. So this is quite nice. Okay. And um, you would be able then to create an image from the save the image of the word cloud somewhere on your computer and then import that into your PowerPoint or to your um, word document as, as as you may need it. Okay. Then um, the last one here is the AI coding. And so um, I'll, I'll first see which documents I imported here. Is it the one that I'm going to demonstrate? I'm just quickly going to add um, another document, add documents uh, folder. I think. Is just actually one, but I could actually add the whole folder. Um, there was a minimal friendship. Let's select that. Sometimes there may be an issue with something that can't be brought in. Okay, let's try just a specific file. Uh, 
No, it's not. Okay, well, let me just um, pretty close here and open up one of the projects that I have uh, available. So let's say import project. Um, I think it was children happiness. Okay. Let me write that one. So this is a, a, a previous project bundle that's already been created from a project. And so instead of saying create new project, I've just clicked on import. That allows you then to search on um, on your desktop or computer for that file. And then it imports it, you know, the code, the quotations, the documents, all of that converted into various locations. And then once it's imported, then it automatically pops up onto your screen. And you can see if we have a look here that there's 31 documents attached to it with 66 codes and um, 459 quotations, 14 memos and two networks. So this is a um, completed project. And um, it has a number of documents attached to it. So it's like blogs and um, reader comments and um, a, a piece of literature as well and then it's got various cases and it shows you the various um, code codes that have been created um, as well as the memos and the networks so what i wanted to highlight here was um, in particular this parenting blog by lisa balkan which is does having children make you unhappy um, then this researcher has has coded her documents or has coded this piece in a certain way, looking at negative effects, level of attitude, looking at um, some pros related to it, so cultural embeddedness, um, looking at some perceptions of having children, some ambivalence, whether it's rewarding. So various codes that have that have been added here. So if I um, create a new project, and I'm just going to call this the AI coding example. And to create, then I might want to just add the file. Um, and let's see. Of the, of the parenting blog. So this is now an uncoded thing. Okay. So if I open that up, the same blog, Lisa Balkan's blog, all about that. So now the last um, one that we haven't really explored yet is then this open AI coding. So this is the, this is the latest feature that Atlas DI has. And um, it allows you then to automatically code this document. So if I click on this, I've just got to make it larger so that I can see. Uh, I'm screen off at the bottom. Let me try and move it here. That's strange. It is completely cutting off the screen now so that I can't see. The button at the bottom here. I'm going to make up my demonstration. There's no, there's nowhere else one can click. I was doing it this afternoon as well and yesterday, so this will be this will be another um, coming from me to the, the uh, developer team. Just that it actually cuts off the tools. When so it's a brand new feature, so they're probably still getting a lot of feedback on it. But um, let me see if I try and open it again. A bit larger, completely cuts that off. So ideally, at the bottom here is the continue button, as there was for the others, and it will be able then to. Code that. Let's close this and try it again.
Yeah, that's a good point. That's me now. Oh, thank you for that, user. <laughs> um, and start coding. It is performing AI coding. And if you have a number of transcripts, it's going to tell you that this is going to take four or five hours. So this is doing two minutes because it's a very, very short blog. Um, this AI coding crashed in the first couple of weeks that it was launched because it was just used by everyone, <laughs> as you can imagine, in the same way ChatGPT crashed. Um, but the more documents you have, the more, uh, you know, the more time it's going to take to actually be able to do this. So this was a nice quick, it was less than a minute really, um, but the more you have, and I mean, it's fun to play around. It's always fun to play around with your data, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. It's nice to explore things at first. Um, and so this might be interesting to you, but have a look at the outcome here. So this was on that, that parenting blog um, on whether having children makes you unhappy or not. Um, and you'll remember that in in um, in the other project, so the one that was actually coded by the researcher, um, you'll see that some of the code that came up was about the negative effects on relationship, about attitudes, um, about um, some of the pros and cons, and about perceptions. So when the AI coding tool was asked to have a look at this and you can review the results, you can actually see here um, what it came up with. So it talks about doubt and skepticism. Um, it, it, it's created a, a code here called human experience pessimism. It talks about parenthood, social influences. So again, you can use AI coding um, to explore your data at first and see what it's coding and what codes it's attaching to those data, and then come and decide for yourself as to whether that is useful or not. Um, if it is, keep it. If it's not, rename it. Um, and so I might say done. And then if I go to the AI coding example, so this is all of the codes that were created by the AI. And if I come to the home screen, into my code manager. This is where you will spend a lot of your time. You see it's automatically created a code grouping called the AI codes, and it will show you um, what it found around doubt and what it found around human experience. Um, so the question, so can I use AI coding to compare my original codes? Um, not to check whether what you've done is correct or not. I would always say, go back to the supervisor or to the research team and rather check coding and discuss coding in that way. Um, you can use the AI coding, I think, as something exploratory, but the, the AI is not coding the data with the knowledge and experience about the topic and um, the, the quest to answer the research question that you have. So um, I would say that you should practice caution with comparing it for the sake of knowing whether what you've coded is right or wrong. Um, but perhaps just um, initially to explore what it comes up with, which may be very different. You're working with a particular frame of mind within a particular theoretical framework or knowledge or, or discipline, um, and that di dictates a lot of the code that you will create, which is very different from the world that the AI is using to, to code these data. All right. So I am um, aware of time, and I, I can see that lots of people are needing to go and to jump off. Um, at this stage, just to alert you to some of the, so we always demonstrate the analysis tools um, in a more advanced workshop. So usually at this stage, um, individuals would have coded um, all of the data and they would then come to the, sort of an advanced workshop where you can um, explore um, some of these uh, additional analytic tools. But um, these are not compulsory for, for you know, generating a result section for your paper or your thesis. This this just adds another layer of interest to be able to look at how the data were coded. This is also where you can find your inter intercoder agreement. So if you've got multiple people who are coding and you want to have a look at the extent to which their coding was similar or different. 
and we've spoken about um, the important export tool. And what I did mention was that you can um, uh, upload something from your reference manager. So here, for example, if you work in Mendeley or Ref Manager or EndNote, you can export your references into a BibText file or similar. And you can go and search for that file. So I've got one here called Mendeley Export. So if I open that up, I can then also say to Atlas, what um, when it brings all of my references in, um, how do I want it to organize it? So it's going to create a couple of automatic document groups for me now. So I can say, please use the year uh, in particular and perhaps whether it was an article book, whatever. I would not click on all of these because it's going to give you a whole long list um, of groupings created based on these metadata, and that can actually uh, be a little bit noisy. So um, I would then import it. So it will import all of the data from um, my ref manager. Um, it will give you a whole long list of either whether if there's been a number of duplications of articles, which it will want you to sort out, um, and if it's, uh, you know, what it might be um, leaving out. And so, yeah, I wonder if it's brought in now. It might be conflicting with the fact that I actually brought this in earlier, but it would list all of the, um, all of the codes here. So let's see again, what is it conflicting with? Okay, that's better. Close. So all of the conflicts that it lists for you, you can just um, go through them one by one. You can see that there are a number of duplications here in this output created. So that's you can eliminate uh, duplicates from Mendeley itself before you actually create this export. And then what's interesting here is the document groups that is created from the various papers. And what's nice, it can tell you which were books, which were articles, which were generic. Um, these, uh, um, this I didn't ask for specifically, but it seems to have created, so I would probably delete all of this because it's quite a bit of noise. And then um, I quite like for when students do their literature review using Atlas, where it's got the automatic groupings of the years in which the publications were released, um, as when you code in those documents now, and you can use your, your um, global filter function, that when you create an output, it will show you what the what um, what you were able to code um, per year. So it can show you chronologically, um, especially if you want to write your literature review in a chronological way. It's quite helpful. OK, so I don't know if there are any last questions or comments. Um, but I can um, otherwise I can stop here and um, as you will have seen with the time allowed, we, you know, uh, one would need a lot more time just to be able to um, actually explore various features, but I've covered most of the important things um, that would need to get you going with Atlas TI in the first place. So um, if ever you need support or help, just reach out to me, um, bronwyn at sun.ac.za, um, and happy to support you on your coding journey. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. That was very thoughtful and very um, good information as how you can even do your literature review through that. Colleagues, thank you for attending this uh, webinar with us. Um, if you have any questions, contact Bronwyn and uh, the IT Hub if you need to use Atlas TI. Um, just a reminder, we will continue with Library Research Week tomorrow. So join us again for exciting uh, webinars and information coming. Thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you so much. Thank you, colleagues. Bye, everyone.